Hi, this is Cindy Cochran. Welcome to the archives of The Cindy Cochran Show. Remember, I'm live Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 11, right here on IRLoneStar.com. You can be a part of the show by calling 936-647-3776. Also, please visit my Facebook page, The Cindy Cochran Show. Enjoy. Good morning. This is the Cindy Cochran Show, and my name is not Cindy Cochran. (laughs) She's uh, a lot prettier than I am. This is Denton Florian sitting in for Cindy this morning, and we've got a great show this morning. We're going to talk about history, and one of my good friends is here with us, uh, Dr. Caroline Krim. And we had a question that uh, the last week or a couple weeks ago, whenever somebody called in and asked a question about Bernardo de Galvez. And I said, gee whiz, you know, that is a fascinating topic. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Bernardo de Galvez, but I know somebody who does. And so when Cindy called me up and asked me, uh, you know, to sit in, I said, sure. And I know exactly who I need to call and invite and what we're going to talk about. So um, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Caroline Krim. Uh, Thanks for coming. Thank you. It's an enjoyable, wonderful thing to be here. Now, you were born in Mexico City, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you grew up there? I grew up there until I was 17 years old, and I did not expect to come to the United States, so it was a bit of a culture shock when I did come. Wow. So, And you came into, when you came to the United States, that was, uh, you came to Florida, or you came to Texas? My mother or? brought us to Key West first, and we stayed in Key West uh, until she got a job in Miami teaching. And uh, as a single mother, she brought up four of us on a teacher's salary, and we got to live in Miami, and uh, I went to the University of Miami. You got your undergrad my... there, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, in history? My... or In history, uh-huh. under the late, great Charlton Tebow. He was a, a wonderful Florida historian. Wow. Okay. And so um, you ended up getting your, uh, your master's at Texas Tech. I moved to Texas uh, after a marriage and divorce and wound up in... Uh, First Sweetwater, out in West Texas, way West Texas, and uh, working for a wind generator company. It's and not the end of the world, but you can see it from there? Well, it's that? pretty close, pretty close. And uh, actually, I, when the wind generator company went out of business, I wound up building barbed wire on the ranges of West Texas. No kidding. In Lubbock. And so when they tell you that there's nothing between Lubbock and the North Pole but a strand of barbed wire, I know I put it there. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was fascinating. I loved it. But I was able to get my master's at Texas Tech, and then they offered me a fellowship at the University of Texas for my Ph.D. So, wow. Latin uh, American history? Under Lat- under Nettie Lee Benson. The Benson Latin American collection is named for her. I know it well. Yes. Yeah, I, did my, I did my undergrad at UT. Oh. Fellow Longhorn here. There yeah, you go. But mine was in economics, so I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know anything about history. Um, and you ended up, uh, so you retired from the uh, from teaching at Sam Houston State University. Yes, I went. I was offered a job thanks to Greg Cantrell. Uh, he offered me a job at uh, Sam Houston State. Jim Olson was my my department chair, and I have never met a man more wonderful than Jim Olson. And I worked at Sam until just recently. I just recently retired, and I really enjoyed it. Well, you know, that's where I, I met you, and, and we met. I was working on the Sam Houston uh, documentary and was working pretty closely with the museum and Dr. Patrick Nolan there. And uh, I remember going into his office one day, and we were talking about, you know, where we were in the process and what we needed and because the museum was absolutely just indispensable. They were fantastic. Anything we needed, they made available. Um my concern was that I was bugging them maybe uh, uh, too much, but um, but they were wonderful. And so we got to the place where we needed, we had made a decision we were going to put a number of reenactors on camera. Um, we really actually didn't have this all figured out when we started. It kind of, the project unfolded as it went along, and I said, okay, well, we need some, some reenactors, <clears throat> which implies costumes, period costumes, uh, correct costumes and that kind of thing, and uh, and also a place to shoot. And they had some historic buildings there. And Pat said, "Oh, well, you need to talk to to Caroline." And I said, "Who's Caroline?" And he said, "Well, <laughs> Dr. Krim. She's got all these students, and she dresses them up. She's got a closet full of period clothing, and and they built this log cabin and all this." And uh, 
So uh, I think that's when we, I, I don't remember the exact date or anything, but it was in that context that they ended up uh, meeting you. And we filmed um, one of the scenes at your cabin, which I, wanted, I want you to tell me about in just a second. But uh, we, uh, we filmed the scene where Sam Houston's uh, Indian wife, Tiana Rogers or Diana Rogers, they, they, they ran a trading post in Oklahoma before Sam came to Texas. And uh, that trading post, we, we portrayed using your cabin and, uh, and a character actor standing there on the porch. And, uh, you know, we, we actually we bought some props and also used some of the props that were there and, and filmed that. But how did this, so, so your students, tell me just quickly a little bit about your students and what you had them involved in up there. I mean, because you, you taught history very differently. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I, my master's degree, of course, was in architectural preservation. And so that's why I had already taken an interest in log cabins or construction, architecture of all sorts. But my students, I was the sponsor for the Walter P. Webb History Society. Mm -hmm. And the society uh, encourages the students to become involved. And Linda Pease in Linda. Huntsville, who is the head of the Huntsville Arts Commission. Wonderful woman. Wonderful woman. And blessings on her. She asked me if, if my students would be interested in moving a cabin that had been donated to the city, the Roberts Ferris cabin. And so thinking, you know, Lincoln Logs, we can just pull it apart, put it back together. I said, of course. I had two Texas history classes, one an undergraduate class and one a graduate class. And so that summer... Uh, in July and August, in the heat of the summer, uh, I took the students out there, and we started dismantling the outer uh, walls of the cabin and then got down to the logs themselves and realized we would have to move it intact. Oh, uh, wow. And so we just nailed uh, plywood around the sides of it and our little book, Cabin Fever, which my grad students wrote several of the articles in. Um, our book Cabin Fever was about that move, and it was a fascinating experience. And the students, uh, I don't think any of them will ever forget it. It was the kind of thing where they had to learn hands-on how to hew logs, how to move, how to uh, uh, put together a, a cabin itself. So it was it was a wonderful experience for them. And, of course, that just mushroomed into other cabins the the big bear bend cabin mm -hmm. on the grounds of the museum is one that we moved and as is the uh several of the other cabins you know we filmed uh the bear bend cabin when it was still out in the woods in montgomery county and then after we were done with it it was uh not that they were waiting on us or anything but but that portion of our filming had been completed and they moved that cabin to the grounds of the uh, sam houston uh, Memorial Museum in Huntsville, and everybody listening, you ought to go see it if you haven't yet. <clears throat> we uh, spent the night out there. One, night. I got to spend the night in that cabin one night, and it was it was ink black. It was like being in a cave. It was so, I mean, it was just so dark, and and it was probably the coldest night I've ever spent uh, out there. It, I, I won't go into all that story, <laughs> but it was um, it was really neat to be able to spend the night in that cabin and. Uh, we were probably, I guess, the last people to ever actually spend the night in that cabin. Well, Pat but. Nolan was so creative. He actually had uh, several programs that the museum ran where people could sign up to spend the night in the cabins. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, Really? Yes, yes. We had several groups of people that went out there and spent the night in the cabin, and we cooked over the campfire with Dutch ovens for them and and. I told stories about the Indians, and when you're out in the woods like that with the That's cabin, you you do get the feeling that the Indians are right there around you. So it was a wonderful experience. Well, that you know, that's the way we've got to do it. Uh, people say history is boring, and if it is, shame on us. You know, it's the way we teach it, and uh, the hands-on history, getting getting kids involved in in uh, hewing logs and lighting fires and, and even shooting some of these muskets and things or learning about them, getting their hands on them, um, really brings it alive to them. And, uh, and they never get over that. I mean, you get the little kids, you can do some age appropriate things with little kids and they're all over it. Cause I've done it and I've seen it done. And then you have college kids who are, you know, studying, you know, serious scholarship at, at a different level and an age appropriate level, you know, for them, for uh, an adult. And um, if you do it right, it's really, uh, it's very interesting. So I've always appreciated that about 
about you and what you've done and, and, you know, voila, all the teaching awards that, uh, that you have had and your work on, you know, PBS and the history channel and the books that you've written, um, you know, kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about Bernardo de Galvez. This is, uh, the Cindy Cochran show. We'll be right back. The Cindy Cochran Show, Real Reality Radio. SPCA Pet Snap of Montgomery County is a 501c3 all volunteer based rescue and adoption organization with a no kill policy for healthy and adoptable animals. Our goals are fourfold, to rescue and rehabilitate homeless animals, to provide a safe haven for the animals until a suitable adoption or foster care home is found or until they are reunited with their owner, to educate the public about the great need to reduce pet population, which includes the importance of having their pets spayed and neutered, and to further the cause for humane and responsible pet ownership, and to provide a low-cost spay-neuter clinic for people who are unable to afford to spay or neuter their pets otherwise. SPCA Pet Snap of Montgomery County encourages you to think adoption first. You can contact us at www.spcaofmc.com. Hi, folks. It's your old buddy, Luke Clayton, and I want to invite you to join me every Saturday morning right here on Lone Star Internet Radio from 8 to 9 for Outdoors with Luke Clayton and Friends. Bill Dance is a frequent guest. Larry Weissoon, Mr. Whitetail, is on the show every week. We talk a lot of hunting and fishing and generally have a good time. So remember, every Saturday morning, 8 to 9, right here on Lone Star Internet Radio. Hi, this is BJ Orner from Montgomery County Performing Arts Society. I'm here to remind you to get your tickets now for all the upcoming events that McPass has to offer. All shows will be held at the beautiful Crichton Theater in downtown Conroe. Call 936-441-7469 for your tickets today. Or go to our website, www.mcpass.org, for more information. Hope to see you at the show. Our community's animal shelters cannot absorb accidental litters of kittens and puppies. Approximately 80% of the animals entering our shelters will not make it out alive. Please help be a part of the solution. Please spay and neuter your pets. Many low-cost options are available. Visit TexasLitterControl.org to learn more. That's TexasLitterControl.org. And remember... Real Texans don't litter. Please spay and neuter your pets. The Cindy Cochran Show, the most opinionated talk show on radio. And welcome back to the Cindy Cochran Show on IR Lone Star Radio. Uh, This is Denton Florian sitting in for Cindy Cochran today. And our guest is Dr. Caroline Krim, who is... uh, uh, quite a historian, quite a neat person, and a uh, retired history professor from Sam Houston State University. We were talking about uh, at the last segment, and boy, what a resume she has. Um, I particularly love it that she's uh, got her Ph.D. at the University of Texas because I went there. <laughs> so fellow Longhorns taking over in Aggie land here today. Um, tell me, why, uh, why do we study history? Well, I think everybody uses that old cliche about if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. But I think it's much more than that. History provides us with ideas about why people behave the way they do. It gives us uh, a whole new concept about uh, our future in terms of our past, about why we are the way we are today. And I think the things that we have seen and done in our own society are reflective of the history that we have had in the past. 
And frequently we tend to forget that uh, the past is something that we can use to benefit ourselves in the present and hopefully the future. Sometimes we don't learn from the past and sometimes we don't learn from the things that people tell us. I know my students frequently think that they don't have to listen to the history, that it's boring and as you pointed out, but history can be so fascinating because it's the story of people. It's the gossip. Right. It's the details. It's the why men became the way they were, why women survived. What was it that made them uh, into the ancestors that we now can be proud of as their descendants? You know, I heard James Rosen, uh, the journalist, talk about uh, a series of inter- interviews he did uh, not too long ago with Vice President Cheney. And as he told the story, he said uh, that uh, several years ago, 10 years, whatever, uh, Cheney had promised him an interview, and somehow they were thrown together at some, probably some Washington shindig, who knows. And, and he said, I saw Vice President Cheney again, and I, and I yelled at him across, or I hollered at him, raised my voice at him because we were in a crowd, and I said, hey, you still owe me an interview. And he turned around, and he said, uh, he said, okay. He said, we'll, we'll set it up. And so they did. And he said, I interviewed this guy for six hours. I think it was two hours a day for three days. And all of this stuff came pouring out that he had never commented on before. Um, reflections with some years distance between uh, his, his time and so on. And one of the things he said was, Rosen said, that Cheney regretted that he didn't major in history instead of political science. He said, because what I was doing and uh, making decisions like that, he said, history would have been much more useful uh, to me than uh, than politics would have been. And, and you know, you look back at these great generals, you look at Patton, who was a very famous historian, you know, Patton was just eaten up with history. Uh, anybody who's seen the movie, some of that, <clears throat> a lot of that comes through. But Schwarzkopf was a was well versed in history, as was Robert E. Lee and and those guys. So these these generals that um, were able to uh, do what they did, um, I think a lot of their wisdom came from knowing the mistakes of the past, the mistakes of other people in similar circumstances, and what they did right. You know, why should we pay for that real estate again? You know, Patton would say, why, you know, why can't we, um, you know, why can't we learn from not just the sacrifices of the people who came before us, but, but what they did and didn't do and what they did right and what they did wrong and learn from that to, and, and use that as a basis for making some of our decisions or figuring out how that applies to the decision that we have in front of us. Um, James Haley, who wrote um, so well written on Texas history, and he wrote the screenplay for Sam, uh, he, he said one time in a talk, he said, everything that you believe filters like coffee through what you know about history. That's right. And I think uh, your own story of Sam Houston, as you portrayed it in the, in the film, is so much a part of, of what Houston learned from uh, his experiences with Andrew Jackson. And, and so Sam Houston himself, I think, was a lover of history and certainly a man who, who learned from the past. Indeed, uh, he did. And... Um, <laughs> You know, to the great shock and surprise of so many, uh, Texas history did not begin in 1821 when uh, Stephen F. Austin got here. Uh, tell me, let's let's get into uh, Bernardo de Galvez and tell me a little bit about him. Why should we care about Bernardo de Galvez? Well, I think everybody knows Galveston, but to, to know who the man was whose name, whose family name, not just himself, but whose family name was given to the island... I think is to go have to go back to the American Revolution, which very few people realize the Spanish were every bit as influential as the French. Uh, Bernardo de Galvez was actually sent by his uncle Jose de Galvez, the head of the Council of the Indies in Spain, and he was sent as governor of Spanish Louisiana at the end of the Seven Years' War. Which was when? French and Indian War in 1763. So this is prior to the American Constitution being written? Absolutely. This was prior, 1763? 63, the end of the Spanish, uh, end of the French and Indian War. So this is shortly before the American Revolution. Right. I mean, 1776 and all that. So this is a a few years prior to that. Right, right. And his uncle, Jose de Galvez, um, as second in command to the king, uh, King Charles III of Spain, had taken an interest in the New World and had brought 
his young nephew, Bernardo, to Texas. That actually brought him to Chihuahua, and uh, Bernardo became involved in capturing Apaches and attacking Apaches. And Bernardo de Galvez, as a young lieutenant, learned uh, about Texas and about this north northeastern section of New Spain. And because of that, later in 1776, just as the American Revolution started, his uncle brought him back from Spain and sent him to New Orleans as the governor. So he was hmm. governor of Louisiana, of Spanish Louisiana, which Spain had acquired at the end of 1763. And as governor of Louisiana, he then had to make decisions about what they were going to do, how they were going to deal with the American Revolution, which had just started in the United States. Of course, the previous year, 1775, the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord, mm -hmm. had influenced the Spanish and many of the American uh, politicians and, and leaders were begging for Spanish help. They had received help from France, but France was not particularly wealthy. France didn't have the wealth that Spain did, and so they begged for Spanish help. And Spanish King Carlos III didn't want to get involved in another war because it was expensive, but he was willing to help the Americans, and so he actually sent supplies to Bernardo de Galvez in Louisiana. And Bernardo de Galvez, in secret, hiding it from the British, who were controlling Pensacola and Florida at that time, hiding it from the British, he began to send supplies up the Mississippi River. And if you've ever seen a picture of a aerial view of the Mississippi, it winds back and forth like a broken-backed snake. And to get the supplies up that river, they had to row the supplies in 10-ton barges. And it took them three months and they would have to send these barges up again and again and again. And, of course, when they got to the Illinois country... Against the, against the current against of the, the Mississippi. Current, yeah. Against the current. And uh, so George Rogers Clark, who was the American general representative in the Illinois country, was able to use those supplies. And then you have to remember that this was during the very difficult times that Washington was facing. This was during the Valley Forge period. This was when, when Washington desperately needed supplies, and those supplies were coming from George Rogers Clark across Pennsylvania and to Washington. Wow, that's troops. absolutely fascinating. And George Rogers Clark was the brother of, of Captain William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Is that correct? Uh, event, yes, right. yes. And wow. that, of course, comes comes later. But certainly now, this was Spanish. Uh, um, Thomas Jefferson bought Louisiana from the French. Not so, not until 1803. Correct. That's several so, years later. So when? how did the French get it from the Spanish? The French had actually, in 1800, remember Napoleon comes to power in France after the French Revolution right. of 1798. And so the French, literally the French government, had fallen apart. And Napoleon was hoping to reestablish the great French empire that had existed prior to the, Spanish Amer or to the French and Indian War. And uh, when his troops came to Haiti, and his troops were beginning to die of yellow fever and fevers and diseases. And Napoleon realized that he would never be able to reconquer Louisiana. Uh, so that was when he finally sold it to Thomas Jefferson. But he had acquired it because he forced the Spanish to give it to him in 1800. Wow. Um, so, so George Washington is encamped at Valley Forge. And he's uh, obviously starving, obviously in desperate circumstances at Valley Forge. And supplies are coming in across Pennsylvania that were supplied by Bernardo de Galvez. That's correct. Wow. And then, okay, now fast forward a few, uh, just a little bit to Yorktown. And there, uh, Washington has uh, Cornwallis uh, trapped at Yorktown. And the French Navy is sitting off the coast providing cover. And tell me uh, how that happened with, uh, what did Bernardo de Galvez have to do with that? Well, Bernardo de Galvez and the Spanish, actually the people in Cuba, supplied the gold in order to resupply and to refurbish the French fleet. So Bernardo de Galvez financed the French Navy, which made it possible for them to blockade Yorktown and support support Washington at Yorktown, uh, cutting off Cornwallis. That's right. 
That's, right. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, well, uh, we have a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a quick break uh, again, a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll continue this conversation with Dr. Caroline Krim. This is the Cindy Cochran Show. The Cindy Cochran Show. You ain't heard nothing yet. Are you interested in learning more about preparing quick, healthy, and safe meals for your family? Would you like to spend time with others learning tips and tricks, along with practicing and tasting nutritious food? If so, the On the Road to Healthy Living Mobile Cooking School is for you. Call Amy Ressler at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service at 936 936- 539-7825 to find a class near you or volunteer to host a class. Hello, I'm Bonita DeRosa, Animal Control Officer for the City of Willis. We invite you to tune in to Lone Star Internet Radio every first and third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. for the Willis Hour. On the first Thursday of the month, the Willis Hour will be covering upcoming events and news about the city. Join in the conversation with your city officials and other leaders in the community. On the third, we will be doing a recap of the last city council meeting. The mission of the city of Willis is to provide high quality services, accountability, and professional commitment to our citizens. We pledge to provide those who live, work, and visit our city an effective government that is open and responsive to the needs and values of the community. Again, we invite you to tune in on Lone Star Internet Radio every first and third Thursday of the month at 11 for the Willis Hour. Doing business since 1985, Assistance League of Montgomery County is a nonprofit, all volunteer organization where all proceeds stay in Montgomery County. We are proud to sponsor 10 philanthropic programs that enhance the lives of those in our community. Visit our thrift shop at 126 North San Jacinto Street in downtown Conroe or call us at 936 760 1151. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Conroe now has another first, The Cindy Cochran Show, mornings at 10 a.m. on IRLoneStar.com. And we're back with The Cindy Cochran Show. I'm Denton Florian sitting in for Cindy this morning, and we have uh, Dr. Caroline Krim with us. The phone number uh, here is 936-647-3776, 936-647-3776 if you have a question. Uh, We'd love to take some calls if there are any. Uh, This is just an absolutely fascinating uh, description uh, about a man that I think it's fair to say most of us know little or nothing about. Um, You know, the fact that this guy uh, corresponded directly with so many of our founders, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Robert E. Lee's dad, Charles Henry Lee, and that he became the governor of New Orleans and and was so helpful at Washington at Valley Forge, so helpful and instrumental in in the victory at Yorktown, uh, that he financed the Navy. Uh, It's stunning to me that, that he's not more prominent, that he's not more prominently taught that that we don't know more about him and we should. Well, he has been included now in the TEKS for high school students. And so at last we are going to have a little more information on him. And uh, as a leader, a Spanish leader, part of the reason that Spain has not been given the, rep- the thanks that mm-hmm. they deserve for helping the American Revolution is that after Charles III, after the king died, uh, his brother, Charles IV became king. And Charles IV, after the French explosion of 1789, the terrors of the French Revolution that lasted all the way up until Napoleon takes over in 1800, the Spanish were terrified of the whole concept of revolution and independence. And when they saw that revolution in France, they were really concerned that they would lose all of their own colonies in the New World, all of New Spain. And so that was why they turned against the United States. And in doing that, by turning against the United States, that in turn 
led the Americans to dismiss anything that the Spanish had done for them during the American Revolution. Hmm. So it's been 200-plus years that we're finally getting around to understanding what it was that the Spanish did. Certainly everybody knows Lafayette, and everybody knows Kosciusko, and everybody knows the, the uh, support that the French gave to the American Revolution. But the Spanish were actually the ones. They were the money behind the revolution. Well, now, where did uh, Bernardo de Galvez, where did he get the, uh, some of his, some of the gold, some of the money? Uh, I mean, tell me about the denominations that he paid. I mean, if you paid the French, did he just pay them in flat out gold or was there some uh, currency other than gold that he paid them with? I mean, he's going to finance the French Navy. How does he do that? Well, the French Navy, remember, was stationed at uh, Havana, Cuba during the American Revolution. Okay. Because the Spanish and the French by 1779 had become allies. And so the French are literally without guns, without ammunition, without powder. And their fleet is desperate for sails, for rope, for spars, for everything. And the Spanish, because of the support of the Americans, thanks to Bernard de Galvez and his uncle José de Galvez, the Spanish in Havana, Cuba, are asked to contribute their own money. And certainly the people in Havana, the women, it is said, took the gold from their ears and the gold chains from around their necks and gave it to the government to melt down and give to the French. And the people of Malaga, if you go to Malaga today at the cathedral in Malaga, it is missing an entire tower, one of its two towers. And they actually gave, the people of Malaga gave 400,000 pesos to the Spanish government to support the American Revolution. Wow. And there is a plaque on the cathedral from the Sons of the American Revolution thanking the people of Malaga for never having completed their cathedral because they gave their money for the American Revolution. So the Spanish were tremendously helpful to the Americans. And this was something that Bernardo de Galvez actually gave of his own money, too, in order to supply the materials that were going up the Mississippi River to Illinois to George Rogers Clark and then across Pennsylvania to Washington. Wow, so this was personal. Yes, this. it became very personal for him. You know, uh, I, when you think back of different characters in history um, who were just born leaders, uh, and some of them you could argue might, are, are fun to talk about that they showed up at the right time in history. And uh, I think of uh, I think of Patton, um, and I think of Churchill, Lincoln. And uh, Sam Houston. And Sam Houston, absolutely. And these, the, you know, a, a Patton and a and a a Schwarzkopf, uh, a, a Lee, um, a Sam Houston. These guys were they were just you know Sam Houston, for example. He rose to leadership anywhere he found himself, whether that was in uh, Appalachian, Tennessee, or the power structure of Washington D.C. or Mexican Texas or the Indian Territory of what is today Oklahoma. I mean, he was a chameleon. Anywhere he went, he pretty quickly rose to the top. Uh, but that's just who he was. You know, he was a leader. It just he couldn't help it. That's that was part of his DNA and the way he was he was made. Um, and there are people like that uh, in history who are very. Uh, that's just who they are. They're not. They're not bureaucrats. They're not uh, paper pushers, uh, or anything like that. And Bernardo de Galvez is. Uh, he was constructed that way, was he Absolutely. not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he had fought with the Portuguese in with the Spanish army against the Portuguese in 1762, and he saw the terrible defeats that they went through there. And I think probably it, he learned from those defeats and from the things that he saw going on around him in 1762. And he never, ever retreated again. He never surrendered. He never gave up. And I think that helped make him the leader that he was. When he went against the Apache in the 1760s mm-hmm. in on the Pecos River, his men didn't want to go across the Pecos River And he said, I have eaten the king's bread, and my loyalty is to the king, and I will do whatever is necessary, and I will cross the river alone. And his men, 150 of them, followed him. And so he began, even as a young lieutenant, to lead men. And when it came time for him to become governor of Louisiana, it was also in Louisiana that his own city, his own council, city council in in New Orleans, did not want to fight the British in 1776, 1779, when the Spanish actually declared war. 
the, the his own counsel wanted to flee. They wanted to leave and go back to Mexico, and he said no. And he led the attack, led the attacks on Baton Rouge and Manchac, and, and then he managed to convince the British to give up Natchez without ever setting foot there. <laughs> and then uh, the following year, uh, he led his men again through bitter storms against Mobile, made up his army, made up of anybody and everybody he could get, Cajuns and free blacks and slaves and Indians and Spaniards and and uh, Frenchmen, anybody he could convince. And so as a leader, he was an amazing man to be able to put together this ragtag army out of anybody that he could get a hold of and then to defeat the British, the mighty British in Mobile. And then the following year at Pensacola, when he demanded, wanted ships in order to attack Pensacola and the older generals mm-hmm. and, and leaders, military leaders in Cuba, in Havana, said, no, we can't send you any ships because the British are liable to attack us. And he sailed to Havana, and he demanded the fleet, and he demanded the right for them to help him. And somehow this young 20-some-year-old, who was into his 30s by this time, was able to convince the generals in Havana that they should loan him ships. And he died at 40, right? I mean, he, he didn't live that 40. long. No, he didn't. So and he what packed a, a lot into, yes, he did. into 40 short years. Yeah. But he finally convinced them to let him have a fleet, and then his uncle sent him the fleet from Gibraltar. And uh, so with that fleet, he was able to attack Pensacola. You know, there are different kinds of leaders and different kinds of leadership. I mean, I may do what you tell me to because you're my boss and I have to. So you have this positional leadership. And, uh, uh, gee, I don't like you. I don't respect you. I might even hate your guts. But I have to do it anyway because uh, you're over me and, and, uh, and, and you do what you have to do. And then there are people that you follow. Maybe they don't even have that positional authority. But especially if they do and – you respect them. And, uh, you know, again, I'm just thinking of contemporary examples. I'm thinking of, of a Schwarzkopf right. or somebody who has character and competence, uh, which is the way he defined leadership. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful people. If you want to hear a, uh, uh, a wonderful talk, you could uh, Google <clears throat> a, a talk that Schwarzkopf gave at West Point about three months before he retired. And I think it's in three separate little videos, about eight or nine minutes apiece. But he gave a talk to the cadets at West Point, and he talked about leadership, and he talked about the components of it being character and competence and how both of those are necessary. And and what he learned, a little bit about what he learned from Vietnam about leadership and, and everything. But those guys would have followed him anywhere. And, you know, when you when you uh, – I think about – Bernardo de Galvez uh, marching across the Chihuahuan Desert, and all those men, you know, they don't want to do it, but he's going to do it anyway. And they they say, okay, we're with you if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, there was a there's a scene uh, from the Lewis and Clark expedition where they get to a fork in the river. Um, they're following the Missouri River, and they come to a fork, and they're not sure which fork is the right fork to go their their charge was to find the source of the missouri and so they spent several days there kind of reconnoitering the area looking at the color of the water and it's important that they follow the right one because they're going to get stuck out there if they're if they're in the wrong place and and the men that were on that expedition were not gentlemen's sons these were men habituated to the wilderness they were uh Independent. Independent. Independent That's that. Yes, and they could easily take care of themselves. Um, And so these are guys that knew what they were doing in the outdoors, and all of them, all of them thought that that expedition should go up one fork, and only Lewis and only Clark thought the other fork was the right way. And those guys said, they said, uh, uh, Captain, we think it's this way, but if you want to go that way, we'll go wherever you want to go. And I thought that was an amazing statement of of what kind of a leader those two men were and i think about bernardo de galvez uh had that same juice you know he Absolutely. had that same respect yes yeah to to be able to after his uh hurricane destroyed his fleet the first time before he attacked baton rouge he raised the ships and started up again and he led the led the men of his of his troops up to Baton Rouge and defeated the British. So yes, he was he was an amazing leader to be able to take a ragtag army like that and defeat the British again and again and again. 
Uh, you know, certainly Washington did that. Fought with a ragtag army against disciplined professional troops. Uh, Sam Houston did that. Right. Uh, another ragtag army against professional disciplined troops. Uh, there's something to be said, I guess, uh, by studying history. You look at some of these victories and some of the way these armies stacked up. And just because you've got the professional disciplined troops doesn't necessarily mean you're going to come out on top of this thing if history has anything to say about it. That's right. Right. That's right. Um, okay, well, we are going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back with you again. Our phone number here is 936-647-3776. This is IRLoneStar.com uh, is the uh, Internet address, IRLoneStar.com, and we'll be right back. This is the Cindy Cochran Show. The Cindy Cochran Show. You ain't heard nothing yet. Hello, Montgomery County. I'm Rachel Baldwin with Special Olympics Texas Area 6. Are you a fan of courage? Are you a fan of determination? Are you a fan of acceptance, grace, and skill? Then you're already a fan of Special Olympics. Make it official. Volunteer, coach, and or compete and be a fan of dignity and acceptance. The dedication of our Special Olympic Texas volunteers provides mainstreaming experiences for athletes with intellectual disabilities. You will touch the heart of another person, and it will move you in a meaningful way that lifts the spirit. Please visit the Heart of East Texas Area 6 webpage at www.sotx.org. Also, like us on Facebook to be a fan and be part of Special Olympics Texas. Tune in every Sunday night right here on Lone Star Internet Radio for adventure, romance, thrills, chills, and everything vintage radio drama can bring. The Players Theatre Company Old Time Radio Hour comes to you every Sunday at 7 p.m. with brand new episodes monthly. Our productions always feature actors, music, and sound effects performed completely live. And now you can enjoy seeing each new episode performed on stage at the Owen Theatre in Conroe. Check out www.irlonestar.com for information about upcoming episodes. Relive the glory days of vintage radio drama right here with the Players Theatre Company Old Time Radio Hour on Lone Star Internet Radio. Our community's animal shelters cannot absorb accidental litters of kittens and puppies. Approximately 80% of the animals entering our shelters will not make it out alive. Please help be a part of the solution. Please spay and neuter your pets. Many low-cost options are available. Visit TexasLitterControl.org to learn more. That's TexasLitterControl.org. And remember, real Texans don't litter. Please spay and neuter your pets. Doing business since 1985, Assistance League of Montgomery County is a nonprofit, all volunteer organization where all proceeds stay in Montgomery County. Through our Operation School Bell program, we have provided new clothes to over 50,000 students in our county. Visit our thrift shop at 126 North San Jacinto Street in downtown Conroe or call us at 936 936- 760-1151. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. The Cindy Cochran Show. Even if these walls could talk, they couldn't get a word in edgewise. And welcome back to the Cindy Cochran Show. I'm Denton Florian sitting in for Cindy today. And we have uh, Dr. Continue our conversation with Dr. Caroline Krim talking about uh, Bernardo de Galvez. And tell me, uh, during the break, we were talking about some of the other things that he did. Uh, tell me a little bit, first of all, about his, um, it wasn't his brother, it was his uncle, right, Jose? Jose, Jose? de Galvez was his uncle. Yes. And he, he made a trek out to California, did he not? I mean, he was exploring, uh, he had been sent by the king uh, during the 1760s to discover what was going on in the New World, because literally the king didn't know what his empire consisted of. I mean, he had reports from everybody, but uh, there were 
a huge lack of knowledge about the northern frontier. And so Jose de Galvez, when he brought his nephew Bernardo to Chihuahua, uh, he had also come to explore and to discover what was in the New World. And what year was that? Spain. This was during the 1760s. It was it took eight years. He spent eight years during the period from 1764 on uh, in order to be able to determine what was, and, and report back to the king. Well, that's so interesting because Lewis and Clark went out uh, a, a much, they, they took a northern route, you know, they, mm-hmm. they crossed the Bitterroot Mountains following the Missouri River, went all the way to the Oregon coast, and that was uh, 1803 to 1806, and um, uh, so it was a little bit later right. than that, but really right. the, it sounds like much the same purpose, kind of the same motivation, hey, go find out what's out there. That's right, that's but right. crossing the desert. Yes. Crossing that southern route. Is very, very challenging. Wow. <laughs> it was difficult, yes. But um, Jose de Galvez was, was tremendously important in uh, supporting his nephew's career. Okay, we've got a, we've got a phone call. Let's take a call, uh, a question from a caller. Caller, go ahead. Hi, this is Dennis O'Connor. Dennis. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Uh, the, the Galvez is such a, an unknown but amazing uh, story. And uh, you uh, guys being uh, such uh, good historians, I would like to know uh, what other interesting names uh, can you pick out of Texas history, some of your favorites, that are are, are relatively unknown, because I enjoy studying it. And uh, when I I first heard the Doc's uh, show on Galvez on that webcast, I I was just uh, fascinated and, and, and then, you know, studied uh, read a lot of stuff about him uh, after that. So if I'll hang up and listen, uh, and, and if you guys got some uh, favorites that you know are, are, are fairly unknown in Texas history but are just as fascinating as Galvez, I would love to hear about them. Okay. Uh, All right. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Doc, what do you okay. think? Okay. Uh, certainly there are important people during – my interest, of course, is the Hispanic world and the, the Latin Americans. But uh, Jose Antonio Navarro in San Antonio Indeed. was yeah. tremendously important. Francisco Ruiz. And Francisco Ruiz. And uh, my favorite, of course, is my own Martin de Leon from Victoria, who found helped found Victoria. And uh, there are a number of um, people, Hispanics, uh, Certainly, Lorenzo de Savala, who mm-hmm. helped to found, oh, he was vice president of the republic and helped to found one of the colonies. And um, Jose Maria Jesus Carbajal, who starts to establish the Republic of the Rio Grande. He isn't successful, but he does. And Juan Cortina, who was another uh, rebel, but uh, opposed the Americans, but still very much influential in the Hispanic community. So there are lots and lots of people out there that are that are fun to study and fascinating stories. But well, we need, in my in my estimation, we need to learn a lot more about the uh, the Tejano participation in uh, in not just the founding of, of Coahuila y Tejas uh, and everything, but you fast forward a little bit to the Texas Revolution, which is what our film had a lot to do with uh, the life of Sam Houston and everything. Jose Antonio Navarro and Francisco Ruiz signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. That's right. Um, Juan Seguin's entire first command was wiped out at the Alamo. That's right. And his second command fought at his insistence with Sam at San Jacinto. You know, Sam was afraid they would get hit by friendly fire and they'd be mistaken for the enemy, and he wanted them to babysit the camp. You know, and and, uh, Seguin said, you cannot keep us out of this fight. He said, you know, we live in San Antonio. We don't win this thing. We don't have homes to go home to. That's right. And so uh, Houston relented, and they uh, placed uh, some cardboard or something in their in their hat bands to distinguish they white, them and white ribbons around their hats in and order they, to distinguish them yes. and they just launched into that battle and fought valiantly and so uh uh you know the the hispanics and uh the the tejanos had a, a, a marvelous history in fighting against this uh, brutal dictator that was just uh just such a butcher yes um you know he was a bad guy santa Ana was a bad guy well, he had uh, determined that he was going to clean up Texas and uh, maintain control over over Texas for Mexico. And, of course, in doing so, his, his grandstanding um, cost Mexico 
the entire northwestern part of its its territory. Yeah, half his country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, on uh, on there's a little story you'll have to tell me because I don't know it, but um, tell me about. Bernardo de Galvez and the the deathbed story of his marriage and his romance. I think that's wonderful. Well, Bernardo de Galvez had probably not had a whole lot of time to find a a wife. Uh, He was in his 30s by the time he got to New Orleans, and he had not married, which was unusual for military men. But in the New World, the Spanish king did not allow his officials, his officers, to marry a local because they might lose their loyalty to Spain and become more loyal to the local territory. But Bernardo de Galvez met a beautiful young widow, Marie Feliciana St. Maxent, the daughter of a wealthy, wealthy tradesman in New Orleans, a French tradesman. And he absolutely it became wildly enamored of her. And the problem was that he couldn't marry her without permission. And he wanted to marry her immediately. And the only other recourse was to be on his deathbed. (laughs) And so somehow he convinced the priest that he was dying. (laughs) And so lying on his supposed deathbed. You do what you got to do. That's right. You do. That's right. Uh, The priest brought Marie Felicite, or Marie Feliciana, as she was called, uh, to his deathbed and married them. And miracle of miracles, he was cured. He suddenly rose from his <laughs> deathbed and uh, went on to become a very loving husband for Marie Feliciana. They had three children, two girls and a boy. So Bernardo de Galvez got his his wishes. And as a matter of fact, Chapultepec Palace, the beautiful palace in Mexico City, yes. while he was viceroy, when he designed that palace, up until that time, all men and women had separate chambers. They had the the ladies' rooms and then the men's rooms, and he had one bedroom for the two of them, and he did not want her being separated from him. And so they lived together in connubial bliss How at the, wonderful. At the uh, in Mexico City while he was viceroy. <laughs> well, uh, your your website uh, is www. Carolina Castillo Crim dot com. Carolina, just like uh, North or South Carolina, uh, Castillo C A S T I L L O Crim C R I M M. Carolina Castillo Crim dot com, and uh, you have an award winning book, uh, De Leon: A Tejano Family History, right? And you're working on another one. I'm right working now, right? on uh, several, several. That's wh- what I'm doing in my retirement is enjoying writing. Well, we're looking forward to reading those. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Krim is available to talk, to, uh, to, to come uh, be a talk at a, at a corporate event or a, or a gathering or, um, you know, some other event that you may have. If you'd like to, to secure her to come talk, you can contact her on her website. And we appreciate you being here today. It was fascinating to talk to you. I really enjoyed getting to know you better. Thank you. Thank so. you. And... I hope that people will uh, get a chance to explore Bernardo de Galvez, uh, the fact that he has just been made the eighth honorary citizen of the United States. There are only eight. He and Winston Churchill and Mother Teresa. and My so, goodness. So he just last December, he was, by unanimous vote of the U.S. Congress, he was made uh, honorary citizen. And his portrait is now hanging in Congress in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee room right next to Eisenhower. Well, that's certainly appropriate, and we celebrate that. Uh, Richard, how are we doing? We doing all right? All right. Well, listen, this has been really fun. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. This is Denton Florian sitting in for Cindy Cochran on The Cindy Cochran Show, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Y'all have a great day. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy the show. Any comments, suggestions of topics, email me at the Cindy Cochran Show at gmail.com. Also, check out my Facebook page, The Cindy Cochran Show. Join me live Monday through Friday. See ya.